Okay, well, let's get going. And, uh, you bet. And here we go. So, um, audience, welcome to Digital Health Weekly, brought to you by Luma Health, where we will discuss uh, COVID-19 and beyond. We strive to provide relevant content, practical advice, useful information for the healthcare community, providers, clinicians, administrative staff, we're all impacted by the digital transformation that, that we're all a part of. As usual, we'll be recording this session so those that are interested can listen later on their commute, their walk or run, um, or really whatever time is convenient for you. Um, I'm your host, Dave Smith, and in today's episode, we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Chuck Leiter, uh, the Chief Information Officer for Houston ENT Allergy. Um, Chuck is a renowned thought leader, executive, with so much to offer today's discussion. Thank you so much, Chuck, for joining us. Welcome to Digital Health Weekly. Dave, glad to be here and glad to have this discussion. Awesome. Well, um, just to set the stage, um, you know, our goal here is is really open mic. What 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 comes to your brain? Um, we want you to share with the audience um, and and um and as always brevity is 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 you know we're not in a board meeting here so as much um detail and and um understanding the context i as we go through today's discussion i think is is uh, incredibly useful for for the audience it'll be obviously tuned in, um, when when it's convenient for them so to get things going um we'd love to use a bit about your background and what led you to pursue a career in healthcare? Huh. Uh, well, it, I tell you what, it uh, didn't, I never had any big plans to go into healthcare, to be honest. Uh, when I graduated, well, I don't want to date myself, but uh, my commencement, uh, George H.W. Bush gave it at my college and uh, off I went and the economy was uh, you know, it wasn't a pandemic, but uh, it was really hard to find a job. And um, and I was had a heavy background in accounting, um, and the, the jobs were very far and few between, uh, nothing really in finance. And uh, I actually just ended up getting a job uh, in sales uh, just to start working. And uh, and I have a background that's kind of interesting as far as my family is we're heavy into, uh, I guess, education and uh, medicine. Um, my great grandfather was a physician and uh, my uh, grandfather was a vet. And uh, one of the interesting things about it is as I was growing up, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather in the summers. Um, and he was in a small town in South Dakota, the town vet, I guess you could say. And um, I would, we would go out and, and uh, vaccinate a lot of cattle. And, uh, and I remember being there and as we left for the hogs and vaccinated, I mean, like thousands of them, um, there was an issue with getting paid always. And um, I, I remember that. And when he passed away, I remember that a lot of people owed him money and that he owed, you know, pharmaceuticals money for the vaccines and uh, serums and the medicines he treated. And one of the things I thought was, I'm never going to go into healthcare. I mean, it's a mess. <laughs> so, um, and uh, it was it was just an interesting twist. But so when I go back to my college and think about it, um, I got a job. And uh, what happened was um, I ended up selling dictation equipment, mainly law firms. And then somehow uh, they pulled me. And uh, next thing I know, I started selling uh, these more complex systems uh, to hospital systems. And, uh, and I didn't really have a degree, so, so in case at back then in computer science or networking. Um, and not everything was, you know, open architecture. So we were trying to uh, network a lot of these systems together. And I kind of got drug into healthcare from the outside um, that way. But then eventually what happened is, uh, you know, I fast forward whatever, you know, 20 years ago, I got, uh, hopefully maybe not that long ago, 
working for an EMR company, kind of still in the sales. And then I, after what happened was these systems would be sold and then you get a call back that the customer is not happy because it was not implemented correctly. And they were going to, they wanted to, you know, return it or dump it or move to something else. And I was called in to kind of do the save. And then all of a sudden, all I knew was I then made the switch to be on the back end of it, getting these things really implemented correctly, working with all these screwed up organizations and workflows and politics and uh, got into that. And then after that, then I got pulled into, you know, working on the ambulatory side, uh, you know, for uh, on the other side of the fence, so to speak. So it was kind of by accident, I think it all happened. Um, but looking back, it's, you know, it's been an interesting, uh, you know, road to get here. Uh, and I've, you know, been at Houston ENT uh, going on almost 11 years now, uh, believe it or not. And uh, it's the background for me is maybe different from some other people. But that, that's kind of the, the, the short and sweet story of that. So, so maybe just unpack for us a little bit about that journey. Um, if you could go back um, 11 years ago when you started down this journey, what might you have told yourself that the thinking of, you know, being a thought leader like, like we know you are, you probably back then had ideas of how things would happen, how transformation would happen. What advice would you have given yourself um, if you could go back that would have uh, tempered maybe some of uh, 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 of your innovation and perhaps even things you weren't thinking about back then that have actually come to fruition. Well, what a couple. It's you know, it's, it's interesting question because it poises a lot of you know pain points actually because um, I never realized how much um, healthcare would change so rapidly. Um, in that time frame. I mean, obviously not just 2020 and the pandemic and everything, which I'm sure we're going to get into, but really back then you're talking about all the type of government regulations for uh, PQRI, PQRS, MIPS, MAC. I mean, meaningful use was a big one back in the day. And just a lot of regulatory issues with, you know, going to ICD-10. And these are all things I never really, I mean, it's funny, I took colleges and classes about government regulation, right? I never realized back in when I graduated that, you know, all these years later that this would be the, the uh, industry that it would affect, you know, the greatest amount of change in the shortest amount of time. And it, it, it's breathtaking to think how much preparation you have to do and how much, you know, you deal with the technology side of it, but you also have to really balance it and release, you know, the people, I mean, the, the training, the education, to, to making sure you have the right fit. Um, no one wants to, you know, you know, terminate anybody. You want to make sure you, you're getting the proper training and everything you want to do. Um, but to be competitive, I mean, I never realized how much we would have to change in 10 years uh, just to keep relevant as a business. Hmm. Wow, that's a that's a great transition. Share a little bit about Houston EMP, the work that you all are doing. A little bit about um, you know what you do there, um, how, how Houston EMP fits into the greater community that you serve. Sure, sure. So Houston EMP and Allergy is an interesting entity in the fact that it was actually founded in you know uh, 1907. So it's well over 100 years old as an organization. Um, and there's not a lot of people that you can talk to organizations that are 20 years old, 50 years old. Um, so it's, 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 uh, it's well rooted in the Houston area. And uh, it's kind of funny coming into it, you know, about 11 years ago, um, we, I felt like we operated like we're still in the 1900s. Um, it was uh, and crazy, um, just the processes. And the old, uh, you know, the saying you always said, well, this is the way we've always done it. Well, I got that a lot and um, more than I care to explain. And, and you talk about people set in their ways, 
from doing things, this place was like a dinosaur at that particular time. So uh, really the culture was hard, hard, hard to change. Um, and a matter of fact, when I came in um, at the particular time, they had a, unfortunately, a major uh, failure of the EHR rollout um, across all entities, and it was pretty much um, stalled. Um, uh, for a good, a good, good thing to happen is the practice management software is implemented at the same time was is going pretty well. So we we have we had this old uh, entity uh, mindset you know, needing to change it to get it to basically at that time to at least the 20th century, okay? And uh, when you're talking about people that are just used to being buried in paper and they want to do their processes, it's, it's hard. It's a hard thing to break. Um, it, it really is. And so I had to go through a lot of planning and strategic, uh, I guess, you know, strategic planning and working with uh, forming like a committee um, to really start to get some things changed and agreed upon um, to move forward. And, and once the committee started making decisions on that, it kind of started to pave the way for some major um, changes um, in this organization, which eventually led to, you know, uh, you know 13 locations, finally getting current on certain uh, basic technology like electronic health records. So we serve a wide uh, area of the Houston market, and it has a lot of dem different demographics from very young, uh, very suburban to very urban downtown location to sometimes a little, you know, country location. So um, and, and this is Texas, you know, it's a big state and Houston's a big city and there's a lot of diversity and there's a lot of different languages spoken, uh, different cultures as well. Um, and so there's a lot of competing things going on within our own organization. Because uh, I always like, I mean, each organ, each uh, clinic in our setting almost has a different culture and you're, you're trying to get a hold of that and uh, gain trust to make changes within each of those. And sometimes it's a lot easier um, said than done, but uh, definitely. And then two, we used to not, we used to do some allergy, but then uh, about nine years ago, we switched to board certified allergists. We had those come in and that was a whole nother change in type of workflow we had to deal with as well too. So a, a lot of things uh, serving our community uh, over the years, um, and it's been a challenge, but uh, we've definitely made a lot of progress. Yeah, that that's a a um, so so I'm excited to really dive into some of those buckets because I think it's very relevant to other practitioners um, that are trying to instrument this this um, you know where this X Y axis are meeting where we have this digital transformation, yet we have this um, growth opportunity in healthcare uh, for the business end that serve um, different parts of communities, urban, rural, um, obviously different languages spoken, um, little micro economy within the, the, the greater community. So, so I'm really excited to, to dive into that with you. Um, what I'd love to do is have you given us a picture of, of you know, if, if we were doing this, this this conversation really a year ago, what was what was what was life like um, in a, a thriving, growing uh, business that obviously you know, knowing that um, you know, having lived in Texas, I, I know that. That springtime um, introduces lots of allergies, um, lots of patient visits, um, and, and, and clearly being a, a renowned brand in your community. So, so maybe walk us through the planning that went on, the growth ideas, the technology things you were thinking about this time, and then walk us through what the heck happened when you realized, hey, COVID is upon us. And, 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 you know, my whiteboard, which had a list of priorities, how many of those priorities persisted? And what are the things that maybe you deprioritized and, 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 and doubled down on um, as you looked at 
not just the solvency, but being able to serve your patient community in a better way. Well, I mean, I, one thing I think that's very important, and I it gets glossed over a little bit, is really the uh, leadership of the clinic. Um, because it takes uh, leadership to make a lot of these changes um, to succeed. And, uh, and that comes from, you know, the executive level um, down through, obviously not down through, but uh, working con uh, with the uh, physicians and the partners in the group to make this happen. Because unfortunately, I mean, I always say I can do a lot of things with two things, time and money. And, uh, <laughs> and sometimes that my, uh, what I want to do doesn't get happen. But, uh, the forethought of a, I think being an early adopter in the EHR because I think you have this problem if you, if you wait too long, you know you're 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 going to get penalized because you have you competitively you're behind, right? And so there's a lot of government uh, government programs coming out, and some people decided not to do those for whatever whatever reasons. That maybe they're going to go away, or, you know they. They didn't like governments or whatever. I mean, and no one likes a lot of things thrust upon you. But you, the thing is, you have to really look, and I think because this is kind of where you're going, you can't look one, two years out, really. You, you have to look five years out or seven years out and try to um, foresee maybe how this is going to change you um, and not just keep doing what you're doing because it, it's paying the bills and everything. So... So that took a heavy investment. So that was in the infrastructure of implementing like our backbone of our electronic health record and practice management software and patient portal, okay? And then from that point is not only is it an investment in the software, but you have the investment in your, um, you, you know, your hardware, your servers, all this other type of infrastructure, and it can be very costly. And then when you're in an organization, you have new cost centers that you're not used to having, it's kind of reducing the, the revenue a little bit. But you have to get that. So we, we had to have a whole new mind change on, on that. And I was, because of the leadership, I was given a lot of flexibility later on that to pursue, pursue other types of technology that would help us out. And uh, thank goodness at the time, our CEO, he, uh, I gave him a lot of like, I really feel like smaller companies startups or just this early on have a lot, they're more nimble. They're, they're, they're able to adapt more. They actually listen to what you're saying and, and try to make things happen. And we can get a lot done with these types of companies and the price points are better. So I was getting a lot of flexibility to pursue, to take risks because sometimes they're really new um, and they don't work out and they're gone overnight. But I was given a lot of latitude and that's because of leadership. And if I didn't have that behind me, a lot of this other stuff that we're talking about, you know, with what we went through in 2020 would have been a sitting duck, you know, um, for sure. So th that's, that's a, let, let's stay on that track for a minute. So, um, you know, I, 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 I heard, I heard um, somebody hear this statement, you don't hate the player, hate the game, right? And, and so the game obviously became not just optimizing revenue, but optimizing the spend as COVID hit. And so let's take some of these technology decisions that you, you, you put in place and some of you know, your thoughtfulness about trying things. Walk us through, how did you, what were the solutions that made patients comfortable coming back in? Um, well, I mean, uh, I mean, and you kind of keep in mind, I think you said revenue wise, I mean, we were at a all time high in the first year in 2019. Um, January of 2020 was a record, the biggest January we've ever had, we were going to have just on track to do even better. Uh, and then I was in Austin, um, taking a little, uh, little just close vacation, I guess. And I get a call from our CEO and uh, saying, I think we got a problem. I go, yeah, I'm seeing it everywhere as well too. So they asked me if I could come back and we could meet with the board early in February. And um, I mean, honestly, honestly, like, I think we were all petrified, right? We didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, and, and 
as it started unrolling, I think, obviously, everyone thought when they first got it, you could catch it, you die, pretty much. So, I mean, uh, but, I mean, so we've learned a lot. But I think as we came through it, I was, you're starting to figure out, like, how, I mean, look at how are we going to handle these patients? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and what's that look like? And uh, I'm, so I'm looking online for different products. And I start stumbling across, obviously, like you're looking like, well, telehealth. And then like, well, I, we don't want the patients and we can't have 50 patients in a waiting room. Like, I mean, who wants to walk in there with everyone's coughing or, my, you know, you don't know. And, and then the, the flip side is, you know, you know, we're an ENT and allergy clinic. I mean, we're not seeing COVID patients, right? And so we don't really want to bring them into our environment to get them. And, I think our side too was back when you back at the China and Wuhan. Um, if you go back to where it really started in the OR over there, they had ENT doctors doing sinus cases, and in the OR um, there was uh, two physicians and eight people in the OR, and they got it and they all died. And this was repeated on a sinus surgery type thing that happened in Italy. So I mean, because when we stick a scope up a patient's nose and pull it out, you got the virus, and it's, shred it's shedding everywhere. I mean, do, 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 all over the place. And it's, it's one of the most dangerous places that you can be with a patient. And so, and then you pull that thing out, and a staff member's going to come in, and then the whole room's contaminated. It was, it was a nightmare um, scenario. But we wanted to, A, definitely have, make our patients uh, be safe. But on the other side, I mean, we wanted to have our staff and our providers. We, we couldn't have anyone. We can't have our providers go out. I mean, it was very, very um, scary times. And so we started looking um, for different technologies. And uh, I saw a lot of, you know, bolt-on products. And I'm like, man, I'm already utilizing Luma for a lot of stuff. I mean, I think, I mean, based on how this product looks, this would be like an easy you know, add on and I'm, I mean, emailing and calling Aditya and talking to him about that and, and how we want to just keep these people out of our rooms, you know, and, you know, and again, I think what happened is, I mean, because you guys are, you know, not a, you know, just a gigantic corporation to be able to listen to a lot of the customers and integrate that when we with record time was amazing. And then also, I mean, we're, I was talking to Aditya and uh, we were using a telehealth product, wasn't integrated with our electronic EMR, had to manually put it in. It was actually a free product, didn't cost us anything. But the pain of having to re-put the patient information in correctly and have stuff come across, the workflow was terrible. And um, so you, the fact that Luma was able to come up with that product within record time, I was like, what? You know? Done. So we went from, you know, having everyone, our complete workflow of having all these patients come in a clinic, how to completely train the front desk, how to keep them out of the clinic was a lot of, a lot of stress and a lot of work. But it, it, considering everything going on, I mean, I think the patients were scared too. I mean, what patient really wants to come in and sit in a waiting room with a chance of, you know, you getting the disease while you're trying to get cured for something else? No one. I mean, I think that's what you, you're, you were dealing with at the time, and we were able to rapidly transfer into this new paradigm uh, of type of care to keep both, you know, patients, staff, physicians, all, you know, safe and see them in an effective way. Yeah, I, and, uh, you know, thank you for for the shout out, um, and and I, I think that the, the the whole transformation for the patient. And that experience of, of, of mental well-being, but knowing that, that, that you know, folks that, that need to see a specialist like you all, it's an important thing. It's not something largely that you can just punt. You know, hey, if I have my annual physical and I push that annual physical out six more months, okay, yes, there's evidence that that's not good. But if you suffer from allergy or you have you know issues with ears major sinus it's something you have to you know it's, it's, it's chronic to those that are affected by that 
Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts a little bit about the patient's um, acceptance and adoption of those changes. And, and yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, I think that um, it was a lot easier than we ever thought it was going to be. I mean, I have on, you talked about a whiteboard earlier. I think I've had on my whiteboard in the upper right hand corner for about two years telehealth before all this happened. Okay. I mean, talking about it, how do we get paid? How are we going to use it? I mean, all these, we thought about using it for our PAs, mm -hmm. seeing some people if they're okay, then we feel what they, you know, need to come in and have, you know, something done. We'll bring them in to, you know, do a CT scan, what, whatever it needed to be, you know, and uh, it just, it just drug on and on. And then boop, pandemic, um, you got patients that like, I don't want to come in but I need to see someone or talk to somebody. Oh, well, maybe we need to do something about it. And the economic reality, the fact that they're not coming, <laughs> you got to do something about it. And how are you going to do that? Do you just want to shutter the doors? You know, I mean, that's not even economically feasible, you know, with everything going on. So, uh, I mean, you've got, you know, the rents are come due. I mean, you got just all types of, you know, issues to, to, to handle with that. So um, I think that it was, it would just, it was like a perfect, I think it was like, you know, I don't want to say it was a gun to all the parties involved, but it, it just kind of just pushed it. Oh, and, and, you know, not just there, you look at all, a lot of these other industries as well too. I mean, who wanted to, you know, go and buy stuff at Costco or whatever and go through there. I mean, you know, people are using Instacart or DoorDash or, you know, Uber Eats or, you know, what, you know, whatever. I mean, so it wasn't just us. I think it was just automatically everyone saw that they wanted to be safe. And, um, and that was, and it actually was a lot easier than I thought of. And it was a, definitely a lot easier to train the physicians and, and staff as well, too. Um, it was one of the fastest launches we've ever had successfully of anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I, I'd like to. Um, I mean, and, and to Dave, too, that's like one of the things that was really interesting is when we went to the virtual waiting room is how much the, the physician, I mean, the patients just love that. I mean, I mean, who wants to go in a doctor's office and sit there for 30 minutes? I mean, and, and just bored out of your mind when you can maybe be sitting in your car, listen to music, or some people got business talk on their phone or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, it was, that was, that was like the most amazing thing. And not only that for us, I mean, we're in the process of doing, you know, th I mean, at least three, maybe four expansion projects. And to think that possibility of we're not going to need as big of a waiting room anymore. I mean, we're going to be able to reduce, the square footage of those places um, because of this, the way people want to conduct business in the waiting rooms. It's very, I mean, it's from a cost structure and overhead perspective for, and people have multiple locations out there. That's huge. That's such a great transition. Um, so, so I, let's explore that in two ways. First is just watching your face and hearing the way you are enunciating and articulating that time period versus when I asked you what it felt like when you had to get called back from your vacation, right? I can see your, your energy in your face. So knowing that mental health, mental wellness went through this, this in, in some cases, right? Not just, and you did such a good job articulating the duality of the reality, which was it was not just because of what you all do. It, it really wasn't just a, oh gosh, patients are worried they're going to, that, that they know they need this, but they're so concerned that they're probably not sleeping for days in, it, in advance of this. And then of course your clinic staff, your administrative staff, the PAs, the, the nurses, the, the doctors are all living the same nightmare, night after night after night. Walk, walk the audience through what it, what it felt like after you were able to introduce this technology 
And, and this opportunity where technology and opportunity met to, to create a safer mental wellness zone for, for both the patient and, and the clinic. Well, I mean, and I don't know about other clinics. Um, we went through a phase, talk about this mental health part of it. I mean, the anxiety of, we were so scared to see, bring the patients in that we actually took a month off and did straight telehealth. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were petrified. And part of that was, too, the mental health of not being able to get as much uh, protective equipment to wear, uh, limited masks, limited gloves. Uh, we had doctors recycling N95 masks um, because we just couldn't get enough. I mean, it was uh, uh, definitely, we were, the, the physicians um, were, you know, they were, I mean, they all obviously the all frontline staff right in the middle of it. And um, I think that, you know, when you're coming every day, I mean, we had, uh, you know, the full suits on, and, you know, the face shields, um, double masking people, going through gloves like crazy. And then there's a point in time where you don't have any more gear, right? And so we, we took the, the break mentally to do telehealth. And I think that was what was reassuring about that is it gave us a little bit of pause just to regroup and see some of the patients. But one of the great things that a lot of the providers said is that even talking to the patients who were just scared to death, it actually was beneficial for the physician to have the conversation with the patients that they're kind of, we're learning from each other and we're both like have a lot of high anxiety levels and, um, we don't know how it's going to end up, but we're, everyone's trying to do the right thing. As a clinic, we're trying to do everything right to see you. And I think that as time went on in that month, what we really felt like is, you know, it's time to step out. And um, we have some very serious situations that we have to operate on, that we have to do, you know, put a scope up your nose to see if you have any type of cancer or just a lot of type of things, and it's it's time to, um, to charge forward. And I think as that time goes on, it was a good breathing point, but then it was time for us to get more confident of what we really needed to do. And of course, there was some you know fear in that a little bit on the unknown. Um, but in talking with the patients, I think it, it gave our providers a lot of confidence to open the doors back up. And we, we uh, I think we opened them back up mid-April uh, or something, as I recall. And as the patients started coming back in, um, because of the digital transformation we had and working on um, with the telehealth, um, with the virtual waiting room, and keeping people out and space appropriately. I mean, we did some workflow things. I mean, we, we changed appointment times. I mean, we were not going to be seeing patients every 10 minutes. You know, we were, we started um, um, seeing them basically every 30 minutes and everyone's like, oh my gosh, that's, you know, uh, it's terrible to be, you know, go so slow. But at the end of the day, we didn't have the patient volume anyway, because no one really wanted to come in, you know, <laughs> so it, was kind of, it was kind of funny, but the ones that really needed to did, and it allowed us because of the slowdown to really work on our workflow. I mean, to perfect, you know, if, if someone did fill out a particular screener for COVID, um, that we could really, you know, call them and talk to them appropriately and maybe convert automatically if the physician thought to telehealth and and do that particular visit. And if all worked and that, if they were okay with that, then they're like, okay, yeah, we do need, we're, we're okay. I mean, we're acceptable with this fever and you've had this cough a long time. That is more of a chronic cough, not a COVID thing. Um, we need to see you in. And it just slowly would, you know, over time. But I think what helped in this whole process is our patient volumes dropped so dramatically that we're able to adopt, you know, telehealth, you know, vir I mean, all these, you know, virtual visits and, and, you know, virtual waiting rooms. All, and these workflows are huge because you, if you have a patient in the car and you don't have an insurance company or a driver's license, you don't want to bring them in until you're ready for them because you don't want to, you know, something at the front desk like all these people or too many people in. Just the technology to securely... Uh, you know, send those in and have them imported and vetted out before the appointment. And those those things, as far as the digital transformation, um, which I had, like I said earlier, the like telehealth on my board for two years was done 
within like a week, you know, <laughs> adopted, people are using it, you know, these type of things. So it, it really, it really helped us um, get through and get a lot more confidence. And I think, I think it gave the fact that the patients were coming back slower, gave our staff time to learn too, like, okay, I need to, you know, disinfect this, I need to do this. And they had the time. At first, they weren't, didn't really know how to do it right. But because we had the lower volumes at first, I gave them time to really do that. And then they also learned through this is that just some basic hygiene issues that we didn't necessarily need to change gloves every time we saw a patient, you know, every time. The front desk didn't necessarily have to, they were wearing gloves. I mean, there's all these little things going on that we got a lot more confident in. I think it helped. Now, what hurt is when staff members actually got COVID. And we had some that did. And we had a couple that ended up on uh, ventilators, you know, very serious situations. And they were able to recover and they were able to get back to work. And, uh, and when that happens, you, uh, that's a very um, dramatic time, but just very, like, emotionally charged and just so thrilled um, to see something go back on it. So, I mean... We, we didn't have anybody pass away from it, but like other clinics, we've had people get it, but we were resilient at doing so. And, and I think that, I mean, if you have good people working in your organization with good technology, you can get through a lot. Yes. So let's, let's jump off into, into um, you, know, you, 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 you personally have such an interesting background. Um, you know, the story you shared to open the dialogue about you know, this multi-generation of, of, of serving and whether it was serving um, families, uh, pets or livestock, which they were, you know, they, they were using to, to provide for their families or whether it was um, you know, your family members that were physicians. And it's really interesting, Chuck, because your clinic is really unique because of it. That it really at its root has this uh, focus on a return to small care where, where you, you know your provider, your provider knows you. And if you think about your journey in technology up to today, you know, technology and healthcare it is, and, and, and you know, this is no shocker here, right? But as as compliance and infrastructure and governance, which is all there to, to ensure that the patients are to be, to be, uh, dealt with in, in a safe and trustworthy and transparent way, right? The good, the intent is usually for the good there, but the systems that were put in for years were never there to serve the provider or the patient. And now with COVID the past year, we have all grown accustomed to ordering a dinner and having it delivered, shopping for my groceries, sitting in my car, filling my forms out, communicating with my provider, knowing exactly when I need to walk in. When I walk in, I'm efficiently put through an immediate process. So you've seen this consumerization now affecting healthcare in this digital transformation. Talk to us a little bit about how you see the next wave of this. Does any of it go away? I mean, do you see a world where, where people say, ah, to heck with telehealth, we're gonna just go back to how it was? Or do you see these things building and growing Share with the audience your perspective on that as a technologist and a leader. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's here to stay. I mean, it has transformed healthcare in great ways. I mean, the fact of telehealth that, I mean, you can be in rural South Dakota and have a visit with a specialist um, on an iPhone <laughs> is amazing. Um, and I think uh, it, uh, it's transformed a lot of organizations in good ways, um, it, it's it's brought us, you know, at the forefront of the 21st century, in the way it should be. I mean, to be able to have conversations with your providers and get in and get out as fast as you can. As as a patient myself, as family members, my parents, um, having 
being it's more human now, right? I mean, the patient experience now is more dominant than ever. I mean, you can, I mean, we are huge on, I mean, we just uh, crossed over 10,000 reviews last year um, and, and at a 4.8 rating. Um, and, and it has really, for, our, our, for a lot of the new physicians we have starting with us, um, it has broken down age-old referral patterns from mm-hmm. older physicians. And uh, so I use that as a competitive advantage, but I use it as a double-edged sword. I use it to get new patients in all the time. Um, and the fact that we have a voice now, where the, I remember years ago, I mean, 20 years ago, I showed up for a physician's office. I was five minutes late, and they turned me away. Mm-hmm. And I was like, are you flipping kidding me? I mean, I was so, ir- but it, I couldn't do anything about it. You know, now you can say something about it. You know, you don't have to do anything drastic, but drop them a, you know, vital health grade review, you know, all over the place. And the people read that and they make decisions. And the fact that, you know, you might get a referral from a physician, but now you're going to go, you're going to look them up online. You're going to vet it out. And you're like, I don't agree with what he said. I, this other person looks a lot better. Boom, I'm, I'm that way. And I think as we go forward with telehealth and being able to access, you know, if I'm at work and I have a, you know, I did a procedure with us and I a quick post up without having to leave my office right here and to be able to like securely email my provider without calling them because they call me back. I play telephone tag. I'm in meetings. They're in meetings. It's a pain, right? I mean, all these things to make access to care better and to make the patient engage with your practice. If you're doing it the old way and you're making the patient swim upstream, good luck. Because I'm telling you, in our market, Houston area, Dallas, wherever you might be across San Francisco, it is the competitive place. And if, you, if they got to swim upstream too much, they're going to be looking to go somewhere else. And if you can use any of the products that you can um, to make the patient experience go better farther, that's fine. So if someone would say, I'm going to stop using telehealth, or I'm, I'm going to start bringing all the patients back into the exam room, you know, and, and clunk. I mean, it's just, it's just burdensome, you know, and I think we have to really keep that in mind because patients have a lot of care going forward. But, I mean, there's going to be a lot of new things that really get pushed coming out there in the fore. I mean, as consumerism happens, I mean, surprise billing is going to be a big one, right? I mean, transparency on, on bills out in the marketplace, I mean, if you go and get an MRI done and the billable charges are four thousand dollars at one facility and they're three thousand another and you pay a cash price of two fifty, I mean it, it really starts, you know, that the technology on that side is gonna be really interesting as we go to the forefront of, you know, some of the stuff with that. I mean, and then also like the quality care, right? I mean, I think at the end of the day you have all this technology out there. I mean, is the patient that you're treating are the outcomes appropriate? Are they really getting there? So all the measures that we're looking at for quality and outcomes are huge. I mean, think about how much we spend on healthcare in the United States of America. We spend basically more than any other country. And are our results any better than the other countries? It's very debatable. And I think as we go through the next you know, 10, 20 years, a lot of this stuff is going to be at the forefront of healthcare, and there's going to be driving technology, of course, and people and processes to really get this better. And I don't think anything that we're doing now is at any stream going away. As a matter of fact, um, it can help any organization because, I mean, one of the biggest things you have is high overhead costs. If you're looking at your overhead costs, You've got to use, look for technology that's reasonably priced to b- deliver the care at an affordable price for the patient. At the end of the day, you have to make a profit to pay for all this stuff. And you have to be very cognizant um, from a business perspective as well, too, keeping in mind, I mean, you've got the patient at the forefront of doing this. So there's a lot of, lot of things that are mixed throughout this that have to be, it's, it's a delicate dance for sure. And um, a lot of change is coming. And I would say that if you're on the backside of it, you're going to get 
you know, rolled over by that big, you know, rock. It's going to just roll, that ball's going to roll right on top of you. So try to stay ahead of it as much as you can. It's going to make a big difference. Yeah, I, th th that's super insightful. I mean, I, I think that, that one of the, the hidden um, pieces of advice that, 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 that came out of this discussion stuff was we have many leaders like you that will, that will do an unbelievable job articulating revenue recovery, how they have been able to, um, you know, how they've been able to get their clinics and their staff and this activity. And all that is a reality. But, but some of the hidden benefits, though, that have come over the past year um, have become hey, we made this big EHR, EMR investment. And when we did that, we, we created a portal. But my patients aren't going to that portal. It's a great portal. It's got lots of unbelievable things. And so one of the things that you, you spoke about, and I would love for you just to opine for just a moment on it, is this thoughtfulness of finding technology that, not, that doesn't just add a incremental benefit without having an additive benefit. Because there are technologies, I'm sure, that every clinic can look at, but at the end of the day, you might get an increased yield in something, but what do you gain though? You gain another system to manage, another bridge you have to build. And at the end of the day, if the largest expense has been your EMR, your EHR, getting more ROI out of that is instrumental to the capital efficiency of growth. And so I would love for you maybe um, to just give us your thoughts on that as a technologist and a leader um, for the audience. Yeah, I mean, I think you gotta really look at, you know, what, is, what are your overall goals, right? I mean, I think um, in each organization is a little bit different. Um, because what happens is the reason why I think we've started looking at these type of technologies is, and I think I talked about a little bit earlier, is like with the patient experience. Um, if you can't drive uh, a simple conversation with the patient and be able to communicate, because if you look at the top six com patient complaints, communications, one of them, I mean, um, as long as bedside, there's a number of them, but you know, communication is huge, right? If you can make that as easy as you can with the technology, like a texting technology, um, you know, it, it's going to make things easier. For instance, like if you come in as a patient and you're coming in tomorrow and something happens and you have to cancel the appointment, um, life happens, right? But what happens on a revenue standpoint is you have an open slot. And you have a, a you have a resource a physician that's just sitting there, um, and some of our physicians are very busy, but having technologies that hey, having people that are just desperate to see this physician, automatically text them without any human intervention whatsoever at all, and offer it up, and they grab it right away. A, it makes the provider happy that they're not sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Um, B, it makes a patient that wants to get in and have a problem solved really happy. And you, you gained, you know, you didn't lose that revenue. And I think sometimes there's all these revenue leaks that we have and these technologies like EHRs can only do so much. Mm -hmm. And so utilizing some of those little things, which seem like a little thing, but you take 10, 14 locations and just canceling appointments and you're like, how do I keep the revenue numbers up? That's one simple way to do that because... I mean, I mean, every organization is different. We're always looking at, you know, ways to capture, you know, new patients um, because new patients become established patients. And so we're always tracking new versus established, potential new, all these other things. And utilizing some of these technologies to uh, be able to do that because, again, you don't want to make the, the patient swim upstream too much because they're going to go somewhere else if they can't get in to see you if you make it too cumbersome. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, totally um, on point for the audience. And I think very, very um, impactful words. As we round the corner here to, to um, concluding the conversation, we'd love to play word association with you. 
I'm going to throw out a term or, or a word and just immediately what comes to mind. Um, digital transformation. Hmm. I would say digital transformation for me has been uh, an improvement in workflow for us. Consumerization of healthcare. Hmm. One of the, one of my more passionate things as well too is, and I would say, um, a much better patient experience and much more say in the process. Telehealth. Fantastic access anytime and anywhere. Importance of mental health and providers and clinicians. Uh, that's that's. Mental health is just, that's so important. Um, I mean, it affects so many, I mean, so many people and our providers too. And uh, I would say with, with the mental health one is uh, just really a peace of mind and confidence that you're going to be all right. March, 2020. Hmm. The brink of financial disaster. March 2021. Hope. The complete opposite. I mean, I think um, the fear, I guess, would be the complete opposite of hope, you know, on, on the 2020. I mean, paralyzed by fear, really not a lot of hope. And I think that as we almost, you know, almost to February right now, we, we see a lot of things. I mean, we're going to be wide open in March. And so much has changed. Our processes have changed. The way we do business with our patients has changed. And for the better. For the better. Amazing. Well, listen, I, I, uh, for the audience, um, thank you for your thoughtfulness, consideration, your time, your uh, sage wisdom, the advice you gave. Um, our live audience, I know, will, will, um, will, will, will take the, 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 these best practices. And, and for, for the many that are gonna to listen to this in days to come, Chuck, thank you so much for everything you're doing. And thank you for the advice. I think it's very practical um, and several creative ideas. And obviously your thoughtful commentary is, is so appreciated. Um, from the entire Digital Health Weekly community, Chuck, we say thank you. And thank you for being a leader um, thank you for the inspiration. Um, for the audience that, that um, is interested, um, Chuck has made his contact information available. Um, I, I, I know that, um, that, that anybody that speaks with you is always in a better spot. Um, just really appreciate the time today, Chuck. And I, I, I wish you a, uh, a wonderful, um, wonderful end of January. And my hope is that for for your business in the community, that it's it's um, up and to the right, and we look forward to hopefully talking to you down the road. That sounds great. I enjoyed it. Uh, great job, and I'd be glad to talk to if anyone's got any questions. Be glad to visit with them. Uh, conversation, questions, help, whatever. Um, always, I always learn from everyone I talk to. So it's a two-way street. Thank you, thank you, and and uh, and. and Again, thanks again, Chuck. Have a wonderful weekend, and we look forward to talking to you again. You too, Dave. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.